these guys in, in a few days invented this really incredible new way of doing a, 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 a lobster trap that could actually save money to the lobstermen and prevent whale entanglement. They, they filed a provisional patent. Again, this was in June. They've started a company around this kind of thing. That's inspiring, right? And in that snippet, we have Paul Boonge. Hopefully I'm saying his last name right. I'm not good at names. He is the co-founder of Conservation X Labs, and he was a chief science and vice president for XPRIZE. But Conservation X Labs, it is about a new way of getting people into conservation. And in this episode, we get into conservation, how he got into it, the inspiring story behind that, the things he's working on, a couple examples of what came out of Conservation X Labs. And then we get some book recommendations, and he disagrees with me on longevity at the end, but it was it was very fun. So I hope all of you get something from this as well. Tune in every Tuesday to the Learning with Lowell podcast with me, your host, Lowell, to hear world-class scientists, startup founders, CEOs, and authors, people who you wouldn't normally hear about but are making huge waves all the same. You'll understand them and their work by hearing their passion, laughter, advice, and hearing them, the experts, break down what they're working on so that you can learn, push the boundaries of your knowledge, and understanding. Three quick ways to show your support and get unique, exclusive, and fun content is by checking out learningwithlowell.com website, our Patreon page. Even if it's just a buck, it keeps this advertisement free and subscribing the first question i ask is about how to get involved in conservation and so let's get into this we, we talked previously that that you're really big on getting people involved in conservation like everyone involved are there any key ways that people can learn about local conservation because there's usually something going on nearby but like it's i think people sometimes have the desire to do good but maybe they don't see how to apply it being interested in conservation and, and protecting nature very often starts at the local level with what's around you, with what, what you care about and what you can see. And yes, the, 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 every even small town has things like a natural history museum or something like that. And usually natural history museums are a fantastic place to start. There's educational programs. They'll often do things like bio blitzes where people go out on the weekend and survey what is in their backyard kind of thing. You might find little snail species that people didn't know existed kind of thing. That's a fantastic way to do it. You, you're, if you're nearby to any national park lands or even state park lands or anything else that's protected, they're always in need of, of assistance and help trail rebuilding or with uh, cleanups and things like this that can be a really nice way to engage. And then a lot of cities actually have these kinds of nature parks embedded within them. I know near me is this really interesting new one where they, they rebuilt um, – I forget what the, what it used to be, but it, it was a brownfield, something that, that, that shouldn't have been there. And they turned it into a park with all of these native species. And now people come in and they even have like cooking classes with native species. How do you cook with things in your back, backyard kind of thing? So oftentimes there's also just local parks nearby that will have a program uh, of great interest to people. But then even if you don't have all of those things, I think one of my absolute favorite ways of getting involved in your local nature is this app, iNaturalist, uh, which is – was is run by the California Academy of Sciences, but they've got some really fantastic technology on there. And what you do is literally take a picture of anything, an organism, it could be a plant, an animal, you don't know what it is, and it will help identify based on that picture what species you're looking at. And then people engage on there. It's also kind of a social network in a way, it's like social media, because people start to talk about what that is, either what you think it is is not correct, and there's somebody that happens to be an expert in that kind of lizard and says, no, actually, you found this lizard. But the other thing it does is it helps scientists track where things live. And, and iNaturalist is now used, because this is, this is hundreds of thousands of, of observations happening, you can track where species are moving, for example. Are birds arriving in a, in a place earlier th this year than they did last year, as, as, as we might expect? Or... Is this species an invasive species? Maybe, maybe this is the first observation of its kind, or maybe it's filling in the range where we didn't, some, something might have gone extinct, or we thought it might have gone extinct, but it's, it's back there relevant. So I, I think iNaturalist is one of the just most fantastic ways of, of finding anything, literally wherever you are, put it on your smartphone, and you'll be able to, to start to understand the biodiversity in your backyard. If you have like a free evening, and you're thinking, hey, I want to do something fun with my friends, just to, why not do something that's going to make the world a little bit better off. And then you can like talk about that and have a good time. It's like if you were playing like a board game or playing a video game, but you actually can like do something with your hands, which I, I feel is just undervalued in today's world. But if you, if you try it out, like it's actually a lot of fun. Like I think sometimes when people 
when they hear about it, they read about it like, oh, you know, I don't know, like you're pulling weeds. But it's like when you actually get into it and you see like you do something and you can come back to that place and always have a sense of ownership of that environment because you helped make it different. I guarantee if you if you just like give it a couple weekends, like it, it'll really change how you, you view the world. But I'm curious, have you have you had any like keystone moments like that for yourself that made you want to pick conservation or you just like always been a drum beating inside you? There were a couple of, well, there are a couple of very explicit moments that, that I can remember. It's definitely my, you know, a love for nature is born in children. Uh, so first of all, right. So I, I, I'm not unique in the, wow, isn't being outside great kind of thing. Anybody that's got young kids knows that from the, the earliest ages, they want to be outside, not inside. And they want to play in the muck and they want to, you know, girls and boys would love to play with bugs until we teach them that bugs are gross kind of thing. And uh, that is, if you carry that along into your point about always engaging in nature, taking a weekend, doing a beach cleanup or anything like this, that's a way to just re-inspire us that we, we humans are animals that are a part of this vast fabric of life. And it's inspiring to be a part of that. It's what um, E.O. Wilson, the famous biologist, described as biophilia, this natural inclination to be connected to nature that we have. But to your point about moments in my life where it's sort of instilled a passion to pursue this as not just a career, but a vocation and an avocation. Um, one was, was just before, uh, right at the end of high school, just before I went to college uh, on a camping trip. And my parents were big outdoors folks. I used to go backpacking out of our backyards. I grew up in the Sierra Nevada foothills in California. And so we used to put on backpacks, my friends and I, and, and go hiking for a couple of days, just into the woods kind of thing, which was always a ton of fun. But I remember a camping trip with my parents to the Redwoods, which are these amazing sentinel creatures in, in Northern California that have been around for eons, but are now restricted to this small, tiny portion of, these are the coast Redwoods of, of the coast. And they're so serene and sublime and beautiful and inspiring, right? It was one of those, those cases where I was inspired to understand more than anything why they existed, why they existed in this place, what it was about their ecology that made these redwood forests so quiet. As it turns out, uh, the tannins in their leaves actually help tamp down a lot of the fruiting and the, and the shade that tamp down a lot of the fruiting flowers and plants that are under there. So you don't have a lot of birds or squirrels in redwood forests, which makes them very quiet, which is kind of an interesting thing. And learning that inspired me to want to go into science, candidly, because I wanted to not only protect these things that I cared about, but to protect, we need to fully understand and we need to embed our decisions and our actions in the very best science possible. And that's not easy and it's not trivial and it's not done often enough, candidly. So that was one really inspiring moment. The other, which I think hints at what you're describing, the can you do something on a weekend, was a job I got in college where I led an alternative spring break. So instead of going and, and partying in Florida or Cabo or something like this, which would have been awesome, I, I organized a group of students to go to Death Valley National Park for a week, for, for the week of spring break, and essentially do environmental remediation, environmental cleanup work. And there was obviously some learning and a bunch of fun involved in there. And what was so cool about it was, number one, it was, it was super fun. So imagine this, right? So I, I, got, I got to lead this as an undergrad, which was cool. And, and one of the things we had to do was, how do you get uh, 20 students out into the desert in the middle of nowhere, dirt roads? so that we can repair a trail on a very sensitive desert habitat, for example, which leads into these little little pools that, that desert pupfish and some snails and other things live in, which are incredibly restricted, very endangered. Uh, well, you, you gotta get vehicles to go out there. And so I rented, I think it was like six black Suburbans, Chevy Suburbans, and, and we're driving out in the middle of, of Death Valley on these dirt roads uh, at like 80 miles an hour across these dirt roads with clouds of dust. And it was great because at one point we got a picture and it totally looks like some some sick FBI like <laughs> like like clandestine uh, endeavor with these black suburbans driving at high speed through, <laughs> through the desert with nothing around kind of thing uh, to get out in the middle of nowhere. So it was also tons of fun, right? You get out into these places that most people don't go, and you feel like kind of a uh, uh, kind of a badass <laughs> candidly doing these sorts of things. But then. You spend all day working, right? You, you might be, like I said, repairing a trail so that people aren't trampling on uh, all over the, 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 this, this habitat. Or you uh, are, are working with the rangers to 
fit out the new recycling system so that people are leaving less of a footprint when they're visiting these, these, these areas like, like Death Valley. And what was so cool was at the end of the week, the very last thing that happened was this was, I'm, 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 I, this will date me, but this was the year that the Hale Bob Comet was visible. And you could see it just before dawn typically. And so we, what we did was to walk up, hike up what's called Telescope Peak, which is, I think it's like an 11 or 12,000 foot peak right above Death Valley. And so it's covered in snow. Uh, but you can see all the way down to uh, Badwater, which is 200 feet below sea level, uh, and, you, and, and straight down there. But we're sitting and we hike up in three to four feet of snow to a spot before dawn where we can sit down and watch sunrise, watch the hale Comet across Death Valley coming up over the Funeral Mountains, which are these beautiful reddish-orange mountains. And I remember all of these uh, these, these, these students with me, like we're all students, right? And I remember just the conversations, uh, of how inspired everyone was to act and how just being, being there for a week with people that all cared deeply about this, uh, and we're doing something together, right? Remember we're a social species and doing something meaningful together inspired all of these others from different majors, everybody studying different things to want to do something in conservation for the rest of their lives. And the conversations are buzzing and then it quiets down as we see Hale, the comet, Hale Bop and the sunrise. And that peace, I think, that what we're doing is meaningful and shared. That, you know, that, that, that was one of those moments in life that you get where you say, yeah, I can keep doing this forever. <laughs> this, this, this feels great. And it's necessary, and there's a way to push forward. So I think those those two moments really, for me, made me feel like this was this was more than a hobby, but it it, it could be something to enliven and enrich the meaning of of my life because it could enrich so many other lives. I imagine it's been a few years since you've been an an undergrad, so I'm curious, like how have you, <laughs> have you been able? Just a couple. <laughs> just a couple. Um, are there are there moments in a in a typical year, like when you're working, where you try to get similar things like that going on, and, and if so, are there like examples of it? But I'm just I'm just wondering, like you you talk about this moment that was like capturing lightning in a bottle, and and I'm curious, or like I'm just curious, are you able? Have you been able to replicate it? Have you been able to infuse it in your life? Have you basically have you found a way to like keep that spark alive? And like, how have you been able to to keep that spark alive? Because I think I think sometimes like people get that moment where like, oh wow, you know, and then they they climb down the mountain. They go back to their day job, but I think there's like things you can do, like set things in place to like keep, keep like that boulder moving. So it like, or like keep that snowball moving. So it becomes a snowman at the bottom of it. And like, you, you can like make something cool out of it. If that makes sense. As like a, a very, it does. I'm not good at analogies, but hopefully that made sense. No, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and to be totally candid there, you know, I've been lucky, but I've also worked very hard to make my career, what, what pays the bills align with what my passions are. And that's, and it's not easy. And I don't want to, I don't want to pretend like it is. And it's actually been quite difficult in my career, right? Cause I went in, into science, uh, which is fantastic and I love it, but it's, it wasn't always going to be my career, right? Essentially going into academia, being a, a researcher, a professor, etc. There were other sorts of, of opportunities that I wanted to pursue, but those aren't career paths that are, that are lined out for most people. Candidly, if you go and get a PhD, it's less than 10% of U.S. PhDs, of, of PhD graduates, get a job in academia. So you have to leave. You have to go to something else. And those career paths for PhDs aren't outlined well. They are, uh, in fact, sometimes they're discouraged. And that's, that's really problematic. So it, it, takes, it takes a lot of effort to, to sort of drive new careers in doing things that, that, can, that can keep that spark alive, as, as, as you describe it. And I think that's perfectly okay. For most people, you need to get a job and, you know, go Go, go work your desk job and be, you know, do, do what's meaningful for the world. Got to, we, got, we all got to pay the bills and find other ways to, to, to keep that spark alive. Uh, I'll be honest, the most, so I've been lucky, uh, like I said, in, in, in doing some of these programs. I'll, I'll give you another example. I, um, uh, right now, I, I get to spend uh, all of my time on Conservation X Labs, which is this uh, organization that I co-founded with a dear friend of mine, uh, Alex Dagan which is bringing technology and innovation to conservation. So we're like a tech company, but working on ending the sixth mass extinction, which is 
uh, huge challenge and really exciting and interesting. We, the great thing is, number one, working with passionate people and figuring out a way to build relationships with other organizations and individuals on our team that all care about this kind of thing. That keeps the spark alive because it means it's kind of, you know, that there's fun and there's interest and everybody's kind of pulling in the same direction. But it also means that, for example, we did a what we call a big think, which is like a, a day long workshop around how we can what, what are the next big breakthroughs we need in water for nature, rather than just thinking about saving water or making sure that water quality is is sufficient for humans to drink. How do we think about its benefits for the species that live in the streams or around the lakes or how that affects the ocean downstream? And to do that, we, we, we have a whole bunch of research and a lot of, a lot of work that is at a desk and looks a lot like what everyone would think it, it might look like. But we also do these workshops, and we did this one in Lake Tahoe, which is an inspiring, amazing place where we got to bring in brilliant thinkers from all kinds of different backgrounds, academics, government officials, uh, startup founders, et cetera, that got together for uh, a day and a half and brainstormed in this really beautiful place. And what's amazing about that is we also then go out walking and, and discussing and, and thinking about things and took a boat ride. And those, you know, in a, in a, in a thunderstorm, which was, you know, really cool in many ways. So it captures those moments as well, that why am I doing this? And why is this work that really doesn't look any different from what most jobs look like, sitting in meetings or working at a computer? But it, it, it reminds you of that. So that's, it's that kind of thing that I, I do get to do. Or a few years ago, I used to I used to be at XPRIZE, which is an organization that runs these big multi-million dollar prize competitions for breakthroughs. And one of the prizes I, I ran was uh, called the, the Wendy Schmidt Ocean Health X Prize, And it was all about breakthrough technologies for measuring the chemistry of our ocean. We basically haven't explored the, the, the ocean, our own planet. And we certainly don't have the tools we need for understanding things like changing chemistry. Uh, so in particular, ocean acidification, the carbon dioxide that we put into the atmosphere Actually, about a quarter of it gets absorbed directly by the sea, and it causes things to become more acidic. Well, in order to, to, to determine whether the breakthrough had been done or not, we went out to sea and tested these five finalist devices, these sensors, and put them down 3,000 meters under the ocean. So we actually got to go to Hawaii. We got on, on this research ship run by the University of Hawaii, go, go, go uh, travel for a couple of days directly north into the middle of, of the Pacific and spend a week out there testing these, the, these devices. And two amazing things about that. Number one, the sort of obvious thing, when you're, when you're actually, there's a quote we, we got from one of, one of our advisors, a brilliant scientist, um, and, and, and we asked him similar questions to, to the way you do, like, you know, remind me of a time that inspired you in the work you do. And he's just a, a brilliant scientist. That's what he does, research all day long. And you could hear him getting choked up in this quote where he, he says, standing alone on the back of a ship at sunrise, where the sun starts to peek up over the ocean and the water's calm. And he, that's the moment I live for. And you could just hear in his voice this like, this sense that that moment re- invigorates, you know, rejuvenates, rebuilds something inside of him. And I got that moment too at, at, at one point, right? Uh, not at sunrise, because I'm kind of early, early rise. There was a sunset, but it was a similar thing, right? Being alone in the middle of the ocean, there's nothing more to sort of, not put you in your place, but remind you of, of, of where we are on this, on this vast planet and, and just how dependent we are on, on things. And then especially when, uh, you start to see the flying fish jump out of the water. And you're like, whoa, cool. <laughs> that just happened. So that was number one part of that. But the other piece is being with these innovators. Being, it's like being in Lake Tahoe with these brilliant thinkers, getting to be around people that are, that are striving and doing new things, harder things that I could ever possibly imagine. That's inspiring. People are inspiring. There are these, there are these folks that have ideas on how to build something that I never would have thought of. And it could be a real solution to a real problem. And that is everyday inspiring. That's candidly why I'm, I feel grateful and lucky that I can be a part of this organization, Constellation X Labs. Uh, yes, I helped start, but you know, it, 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 it takes a village because we get to see people building things, sometimes in a few days, that could be transformative solutions to a real problem. Um, we, I wasn't there, but I'm inspired by the story. This, we did this in June. 
we ran, uh, Conservation X Labs ran what's called Make for the Planet. So this is like a, a hackathon. We built it in the middle of the, the International Marine Conservation Congress in Borneo and invited 15 teams of engineers and hackers and makers and others from all around the world, but mostly from uh, the Asia Pacific area region. And they came in in the middle of this conference over three days. We gave them some challenges on big problems like, like uh, uh, problems with fishing gear, problems with marine protected areas and monitoring them. And they came up with solutions. And in fact, one of like uh, the, the winner came up with a, a ropeless or a lineless lobster trap. So in, in places like uh, off of New England, put down lobster traps and these lines go up to the surface to, to a buoy so that you can, you can find your lobster trip after, afterwards. They entangle whales. And there have been, I think, 17 right whales killed already this year, an endangered species getting caught up in these in these lobster lines so these guys and you know the lobster fishermen don't want to do this either it's a big it's 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 you know they they, they care about the sea as well these guys in, in a few days invented this really incredible new way of doing a, a a lobster trap that could actually save money to the lobstermen and prevent whale entanglement they they filed a provisional patent again this was in june they've started a company around this kind of thing that's inspiring right mm-hmm. that getting some people that just have a new way of thinking about a problem and and building something that keeps the juices flowing. That keeps the spark alive. The great thing is that is all over the planet. You just need to figure out a way to harness it. I've never been on the ocean. I've only slightly seen it a couple of times. <laughs> but like, I, I am, I'm, I'm going to tell you why it scares me, and then you can tell me like what's it, what's it actually like. So it kind of freaks me out that they can get like 200 foot waves, and then you're like on a boat, and then there's like two, like on average, the ocean is two miles deep. So then. Like I've seen Moana, and I mean, they make it sound nice, but then I just think about like a storm, and then I'm like, no, I don't want to go there. But then you talk about being on the boat, and like, oh, now I want to, you know, it's like, so is it, like, what's it actually like to be in the middle of the ocean? Like, is it, is it really like, you know, like up and down like that, or is it more like placid? It, it's all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think you, I think you have every right to be scared of the ocean. It is a dangerous place at times. Uh, very dangerous place. People die all the time. I mean, there's a good reason there are shows on the Discovery Channel like Wicked Tuna or Dangerous Catch or you know whatever these are. Um, yeah, it, it, it'll kill you. I was chatting with a friend of mine last week who used to be a fisheries observer. So these are these are individuals that go on fishing boats to observe their catch to make sure that they are they are complying with the law, essentially. And he was telling me a story about a, a friend of his that that uh, got the, the the boat ended up capsizing, but she got kicked off. And spent four days at sea, floating there, waiting to be rescued. And she was, and she was safe. Got a tattoo that said unsinkable, which I think is awesome. That's scary. <laughs> but yes, and there are other times where it is calm and placid and, and, and beautiful. And honestly, even, in its, even when it's roiling, it's beautiful. But it's nature. You know, this is, you know, we, 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 we humans can insulate ourselves. Uh, and that's good. And I want to insulate my children from the dangers of, of, of the real world. But it's also inspiring, and and you know it's 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 worth protecting. Mm-hmm. Oh, definitely. I've seen that movie Abyss, and so I just think whenever I look into the the darkness, that there's like some like there are no uh, aliens, as far as we know. <laughs> as far as we know, but like <laughs> everyone always like, well, there's like this. Uh, this isn't about what we're talking about, but like there's like this clip of someone asking Obama and Clinton, "Are there aliens?" And then it's like, no matter which way they answered, people are going to like be like, yeah, sure. You know, like they're in on it. But you never know. Uh, there could be. There's a great movie. So James, Cam- James Cameron made The Abyss. Um, and and as, as you probably know, is a, a deep lover of the ocean. Only the only the third person to ever go to the bottom, deepest spot in, in the ocean. He, 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 he helped build and then and then piloted the Deep Sea Challenger. This, this, this uh, submarine that went down to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. But he also made, you know, so the abyss has these, these deep sea aliens in it, but he also made a, a, a documentary called Aliens of the Deep, which I think you can even see on YouTube, no, which is uh, It's on Netflix. Cool. I, I watched it the oh, other it day. Oh, it is on Netflix. Okay. Yeah. You did good. I love it because it like, the stuff that is down in the, in the bottom of the ocean looks like aliens. Like, like there's some crazy, crazy stuff on this planet right here. I mean, there's this new documentary called The Meg. And it's about, <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's not a documentary. <laughs> it's, a, it's like one of those like Sharknados. But I always uh, like to watch, yeah, I always <laughs> like to watch them as if they're documentaries. Just to like, I, it makes it more fun for me. But to get back onto like a serious topic. Though the next a- Avatar movie apparently is going to be set in the ocean. So that's going to be interesting to see how he right. does that. Especially with if, with his love of the oceans. That's going to be really interesting. The 
so like in in everything you 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 mentioned i i i'm very curious to learn about how you're kind of like there's 80 to 90 percent of phd scientists and there's you know like probably 80 to i would like to believe like at least 80 percent of people would love to be a part of conservation to some extent and so i think you're working on kind of like making these tribes where people can kind of like funnel in and see like you're kind of like blazing the trail so it's easier for people to come after you and so i'm curious like how have you developed that like tribe mechanism and what type of results have you gotten from it essentially there's a there's a couple of ways. Yeah, we we believe deeply that that solving problems requires lots of different brains, lots of different expertise, and that candidly, even if you can uh, that even if you can describe what the problem is well, you don't necessarily know what the right solution is. And so, opening up the opportunity to anyone to help solve it is critical to this. And that's a part of why we're trying to build this what we call a tribe of, of, of folks that want to contribute in some way, shape, or form. That means. You could, be, you could be a software developer. You almost certainly have something you could contribute because you have a, a set of knowledge that would be useful in designing um, a, a piece of software that can help prevent wildlife trafficking, let's say. So there's a couple of ways we do that. One of the most important is through, through what we call our digital makerspace, which is at conservationx.com is an open mass collaboration platform where people can respond to challenges. Here's a big problem. Please help us solve it. Uh, they can develop and design projects themselves to actually build out products uh, to real solutions and connect with individuals to create these teams that can do so. So that's that's a really great mechanism to do so, because as I'll give you an example. There's this one fantastic project we have on there called Chimp Face. Uh, really, really bright uh, young scientist came to the digital makerspace uh, several months ago, and she put up there this idea for preventing the illegal trafficking in chimpanzees using facial recognition software. So she says, hey, Facebook can, can tag me in all of my photos. Why can't we use similar type of technology to identify chimps that are being trafficked around the world through social media, right? So that people actually do this now where they'll, where they'll just post pictures of even infants uh, for sale, infant chimpanzees for sale, around the world. And it's this massive, massive illegal trade that, that causes untold suffering, both of chimpanzees, but there's all this other crime that's associated with it. And around this chimp face project, she's able to build with our help, some AI experts, technologists to help build this, this work, a collaboration with the Jane Goodall Institute to get training data, to get images of chimpanzees to help train the algorithms that need to be done on here. She's now got uh, an infusion of support um, from Microsoft. They have this really cool program called AI for Earth uh, to develop this, this work further. So it's a really cool example of where you need all of these different types of experts involved in something and being able to even just articulate the problem and have the, the skills of organizing, organizing a project like she did and pushing that forward, that's the kind of skill set that needs to be done. So that, that's an example of how the tribe can come in on, on one, one project. But it's also getting, getting people involved in other ways. I mentioned Make for the Planet. This is, you know, hackathons are a great way of getting lots of different people who may not know what they could apply their skill set to into a room working together on, on a set of problems. And that's where you pose a challenge. We need better ways of monitoring MPAs, or we need better ways of, of catching fish and shellfish like lobsters without bycatch or without killing whales or whatever it is. And that's a place where an engineer can say, hey, I never thought of that as a problem, but I think I can solve that. And they do. And that's what's, what's kind of incredible. You see these, these really, really clever responses to that. And we also use uh, things like prizes and challenges. These, these, these are all open innovation techniques where you put out a call to action and invite anybody in to help solve it. And recognizing the fact that by doing that, we're capitalizing on the billions of brains that the planet holds and all of the different skill sets that people have that they can then start to contribute in this. Um, you know, one of the most famous examples of this kind of crowdsourcing technique, this all falls into crowdsourcing, but shows that no matter who you are, you can contribute a little bit to something you might care about. One of those famous examples is from Foldit, uh, the, the protein folding program that, that, that you may have had. So, um, our, our, our machine learning algorithms are actually getting quite good now, but for a long time, understand, we could understand what the sequence of a protein was, but you don't know how it functions unless you know the shape that it folds itself into. So you get a long sequence of proteins, but the protein itself is actually balled up in some meaningful way. And 
of course, the amino acid building blocks of the, of the proteins want to hook up in particular ways. But figuring out that three-dimensional geometry is not easy. It, 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 it's, it's actually quite challenging. Um, and so there was this great program called Folded where they essentially opened it up, the researchers opened up this database of protein sequences to the world and said, help us figure out how these things get organized into real shapes. And they turned it into a game, like a video game. So classic gamification techniques. The best person at this game, the, the, the person in the entire world who scored the highest and was the very best at, 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 at designing at figuring out how the shape of proteins should be was this uh, uh, house maker from rural England, outside of London somewhere, who didn't have a, a day job. She, she was a homemaker uh, and turns out was just brilliant at this. And uh, it's, it's a great demonstration that there might be a skill that you got there that can contribute to something meaningful uh, in, in the world, be it basic science or conservation, for example. It reminds me of this, I don't know, car, car, cartoon caricature where there's like a fish, a monkey, and like a bunch of other animals. And then there's like a test and it's like, all right, who, who can ever first one to the top of the tree? You're being graded on who can get there the fastest. And it's like there's like a fish, an elephant, and a monkey, and it's like that's not an appropriate test. Like to everyone has different <laughs> skills, right? Like the monkey's got an edge on the elephant and the fish. The fish is in a bowl of water, and you know is right. in like a little hermetically sealed life, so it can can be in the testing zone. But I think I think a lot of times people are tested as if they're monkeys when they could be a fish or an elephant. And like this lady, she probably didn't even know she had that ability. But you know, she probably wears that like a badge of honor now. And I, she should. I mean, this advances things like cancer research. I mean, this is, you know, it, it, there's incredible applications to this kind of contribution that you, that you can have. So that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons that we built this digital makerspace was to say, like, look, come, tell us what your skills are. We'll even help you figure out those skills. And we've actually got some really great researchers at Carnegie Mellon, University of Maryland, some other places helping us with the actual science of team building and human computer interaction and all of this kind of work. But that way you can put up your skills and say, I might be good at this, or I'm at least interested in talking about it. And you know what? Sometimes it's as simple as I'm really good at accounting. Well, guess what? If you want to, you know, if you want to scale up a, a solution, you got to have an accountant on board, making sure that the dollars and cents add up. Uh, and maybe you are a CPA, maybe that's your day job, but you really care about, about the environment and you want to prevent chimpanzees from being trafficked uh, uh, around the world. Well, guess what? Chim face at some point is going to need some accounting help. Maybe, you know, you jump on and you, and you contribute in that way. So, but you're absolutely right. Some people may not even know the skills that they possess. It's, it's really a matter of, of being willing to contribute. And that's why we Conservation X Labs are so fixated on enabling people to find how they can contribute. That it's not somebody like me who's trained as a biologist, right, and has deep expertise in there. I can be, I, I can be effective at helping to understand the problem, but I'm a terrible engineer, candidly. Right? I'm just, I'm not handy in that way. <laughs> Uh, but Sam Kelly or Hal Holmes, who work with us, these two engineers are just geniuses at this kind of thing. You know, watching them work and being able to build out a you know really really meaningful microfluidics device or an underwater drone or something like this is you know they're not only they not only get excited by it, but it's 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 so much easier for them than it ever would be for me. But that's the key, right? That's building those teams of individuals and people together, building that tribe. That's where the real progress comes in. Um, the great thing is you get to do it with awesome people. This is one of those things I, I, I'm constantly thinking about and how to like kind of like maximize people's uniqueness. If, uh, there's probably like a more eloquent way of saying that. But have you are there like other than like joining up and like kind of like putting your skills out there and just trying some stuff? Are, are you because it seems like you've done different things than me and you've led a much more exciting life. So I'm just curious, are there good ways for people to test themselves, essentially, to figure out, you know, are they more, you know, monkey-like or elephant-like, you know, what have you, <laughs> with the analogy? Like, are there, like, good or ways that you've found to kind of, like, test yourself in a measured way? You know, versus, like, it's kind of like the, the analogy I suppose I would try to use is that, you know, do you want to figure out if you're a good swimmer, you go to a pool and you swim for a little bit versus jumping in the the ocean. And then <laughs> you've got to, like, kind of hope you're a good swimmer at that point. So, um, but that... A good question. Like, yeah. I mean, that's that's not not my expertise. There are people that work on how it is you identify skills, right? And I'm not yeah. talking about college career counselors, but you know, there there is a lot of work in in how you how you you ferret out what somebody might really be good at. 
One thing though that I like, I, I use this in job interviews and things like that when, when interviewing people for a job, trying to understand what number one drives people and two that they think they're really good at. And I don't mean what they've been taught to do. I don't, I don't necessarily mean what uh, your degree is in or what your day job is like, but if, if very often people have an intersection between something that they love to do and they find comes easily to them that, that might best be described as a soft skill. So it could be, uh, I've got a really good friend that early on in life realized that he was just really good at persuading people. Uh, and he learned this because he had a job in college at the men's warehouse and he would sell more, he had a cruddy job, but he would sell more socks than anybody else. Right. And so, you're, oh, I'm a great salesman, which it turns out is a really, really valuable skill to have. But underneath that are a suite of other sort of soft skills in persuasion and relating to people. And, you know, it's it's it's, it's like the, the seven habits of highly successful people kind of stuff. Right. Wherein wherein people can find that sort of thing. And I think I, I like I said, not an expert, but I think there's probably a lot of ways that individuals can can go for advice to various books and, and, and websites and the like to understand how they do that. But what I'm going to answer is actually a slightly different thing of how you can get involved in this and figure out what you're good at, which yeah. is I would suggest people respond to some sort of open innovation opportunity. What that means is uh, find a prize to compete in or a challenge to compete in. There, there are tons of prizes. You can go to challenge.gov. The U.S. government itself has, has a list of uh, hundreds right now of challenges up there. And find one that you think you might be able, for whatever reason, to try at. There's no harm in trying. Um, or go, you know, one of the ones that Conservation X Labs uh, runs, right? We're, we're actually scoping out a couple right now that we're going to launch, one around uh, transforming air conditioning so that we can prevent uh, a significant contributor to global warming. Another is uh, around saving the ohia tree, a much smaller thing from a, an invasive fungus. The ohia tree is this iconic Hawaiian tree that's uh, been been ravaged by this this uh, uh, new fungus that just appeared and is causing very rapid ohia death. So you could also just go on one of these. These are, are not open yet, but they will be in a few weeks, um, and, and, and compete in those. Another is a hackathon, right? Join in, in a hackathon. They've, you know, very often they're about computer programming. Uh, although you could just join a local, you know, coding group. There's there's lots of lots of coding groups everywhere for every age imaginable. Um, there there are seniors coding groups. There's you know organizations like Girls Who Code that are amazing uh, that help teach girls to code, uh, and then join into it into a hackathon. But there's also uh, you know hackathons that aren't about that are design based. You might actually be interested in something artistic, and and designing uh, really interesting uh, projects for things. I saw one. Uh, it was actually it was a small prize. It, it, it went overnight. It lasted for 24 hours, and it was to design the look of an app. And the person that won this won this was just an artist who who came up with a really elegant interface. Right? They didn't have to code anything. They just designed the elegant interface, and then and then some other people took it from there, turned it into wireframes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can also find those kinds of interesting open challenges that are out there, uh, or uh, contribute what you think your skills might be in a in another, call it crowdsourcing uh, application like Elance or Fiverr or any of these websites where people can, you know, take a gig essentially, but instead of driving Uber, you can you can organize somebody's books. You know, somebody like the, if you're if you're just really good with numbers, uh, there are people on on Fiverr that are that are asking for somebody just to do some light bookkeeping. That they've got to get their they've got to get their numbers for a local auto body shop. Could be anything. Who knows, right? Um, or if you care about a particular topic in a particular conservation, join a collaboration platform like, like the Digital Makerships, Makerspace. Go to conservationx.com if you care about nature in any way, shape, or form and say, hey, I'm here and I, and I want to do something cool. Like That's also a way because the great thing there is then you get a community around you that helps to, to, to identify what you're really good at, to identify where your skills might, your contributions might be. And they could be like what's funny is sometimes it's it's that insight from an orthogonal viewpoint that 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 insight I, sometimes it's asking the dumb questions the i don't know what 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 you're doing that that leads to the breakthrough and if somebody if you're somebody who's just really good at asking questions you can actually be really helpful to the people that are stuck on a hard problem mm -hmm. i'm going to try it out for people listening in i'm going to try it and i'll report back and, and and let you know how it goes i'm always looking for i think there's i think everyone has like 10% you know like that they can give 
you know, like where they're going to watch a YouTube video or, you know, whatever in their daily life. And it's like, instead of doing that, like cut out some time in your schedule and like give, give 10%, see if you'd like that and then scale up as you feel appropriate. But I, I, I've met very few people and I used to teach people scheduling when I was in college. So I've met very few people who don't have the ability to cut out 10%. I mean, granted, you know, if you have like a crazy life, you know, um, keep listening to this podcast, but then, <laughs> but, uh, you know, <laughs> find a way to like cut like a little bit out and then see if, you know, try, try something out, especially if it's as easy as going online or like downloading an app and, um, like the one we mentioned in the beginning and, you know, trying stuff out, like be inquisitive, I think. But so I think I have, like two last questions. That's an oxymoron, I guess. They're, they can't both be the last questions. The... <laughs> you can do them simultaneously. Maybe you've got the. Uh, you'll... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. I type, could. Type one and, and, and ask one verbally. <laughs> See if I can answer them both simultaneously. There you go. You found, yeah. you found the loophole. But um, so I'm, I'm working on a. Normally I ask like, how people can kind of follow along, but you kind of just answered that. So I'm, I'm jumping to. I'm working on a series on longevity. And so mm-hmm. I've been asking people if, you, if I could give you the ability to grant people grant three people the gift of immortality as we classically think of it not like oh they get like 10 years extra like just they get as many years as they want until they want to stop uh, to anyone living or who is now dead um but they, you can't love them and they can't be a friend and they can't be a family member who would the three people be that you think would like yeah that you'd give that to i think that's a terrible idea <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think longevity is fascinating and really interesting. And in particular, the amount of work that people are doing on longevity to prolong the quality of life is really, really exciting, right? Because mortality, uh, mortality is central to being human, uh, in a sense. It's, it's, it gives us purpose and meaning, whether interpreted through religion or morals or ethics or even personal self-worth that that focuses the mind and the identity on something more than oneself and i fear that immortality would rapidly lead to just self-obsession and self-aggrandizement that 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 if if one cannot die there is no reason uh to 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 avoid our baser instincts in some ways I, and then, I mean, you know, candidly, right, from a practical perspective, I, I know I'm, I'm totally poo-pooing your question, but you know, from a <laughs> that's candid, all right. Like, have fun like making a fun of it. Perspective, it doesn't seem like it'd be very fun uh, to, to, to be alive when the earth gets swallowed by the sun kind of thing, as, you know, <laughs> a billion years from now. So that, that would suck. I guess we, we get off planet and we go live somewhere else. But. Yeah, yeah. No, it's not like, like, I don't think of it, like, I wouldn't want that much life. I think, you know, there's like a finite amount, but I always... I'm curious, like if you give someone, uh, you know, a few extra years or like as many as they that they would want. I don't think anyone wants to live that long, or I think eventually you just have to go evil. But I'm just curious. <laughs> well, you know, so here's the other interesting thing. Like, like I, I, I think I get the point of your question. Like, who is it that that really is transformative and meaningful? And here's one of the interesting things about about lifespan. Some of the people that I admire the most for various reasons did their most transformative work in their 20s, for example. Right, so. Uh, for example, um, Martin Luther King is 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 a personal inspiration, and, and and for many, obviously, I'm not unique in this respect. But you know, he's giving the "I Have a Dream" speech at what 27 or 28 years old, I think, something like this. He's leading boycotts and 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 championing civil rights and doing some of the hardest work ever uh, in the world at a young age. And it you know it didn't. He obviously lost his life, and so he couldn't continue. But living forever doesn't mean that you're going to contribute forever that you need to or Einstein, right? His, his most brilliant breakthroughs were when he was young. He can, he lived for quite a long time and was very influential and meaningful, but, but relativity and, and, and a host of other theories were when he was quite young in, in his twenties or um, for wholly different reasons. I'm just fascinated by Alexander the great, for example, you know, he was a teenager when he conquered Persia. That's uh, that's insane as well. So granting immortality to an individual doesn't mean that they're, contributions will that that will that that will gain us anything i think from their their contributions those are three examples of people i think are amazing or marie curie who i think is 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 fascinating and 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 phenomenal and and interesting maybe she would have continued to contribute because actually her science was great up until her death as a result of her science in, in in studying radiation um it, 
the other side of it is that you know that 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 the mortality allows us to fixate on the contributions in other words if an individual like a, a really phenomenal individual from the past i mean let's, let's get totally outside the field but not, not science we're talking about but imagine that jesus christ lives forever right that completely transforms Christian religion, that, that, you know, and he does obviously in, a, in 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 Christianity, but not as a not as a not as a corporeal form, not as a not as a, a man. Therein, you can see how religion and, and Christianity in particular has interpreted uh, the meaning of mortality and why it's meaningful for humans themselves, and it would completely transform what what life would be like otherwise. Or if you go to um, somebody like. I'm trying to think of a really somebody, oh, so you know, so I, I love Charles Darwin. I'm going to flip from Christianity straight to evolution, um, and I'm fascinated by Darwin's work. And he and he and he wrote long into into his later ages. Although after Origin of Species, the thing we're, that he's most famous for, he wrote things like his treatise on barnacles and uh, some other great books like The Descent of Man. But you know, some things that he's not so famous for. Well, what if Charles Darwin was still kicking around today? Well, you know, first of all, it would be weird vampire-like sort of thing, but would that would that make his contributions to science more meaningful? Probably not. It might, if anything, make them less meaningful. We might fixate on who he is as an individual less than on those contributions. And I think that's the kind of thing that, that, that I, I hope I've answered your question by by listing a bunch of people I admire and think are amazing. I liked it. <laughs> well, you, well, it's not even – it's like one of those questions I ask to see what people say. It's like I poke you with a stick and see what you do because anything you answer tells me about yourself and I get to learn – a little bit about what you think, like some, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, I don't think you should do that to anyone. And then you list some people that you think is admirable, like you did, you got to the, the heart of what I was asking. Um, so like, it's still a good answer, even if you didn't technically say like, I'm going to grant it to these people, though, I will, because I'm a big history fan, I think Alexander the Great, and like Hannibal, you know, I, do we call Hannibal great? No, that's uh, Hannibal of Persia, that was the great. But like, both those people, like are very successful because of their fathers, the um, basically like, Alexander like inherited a very efficient system. Granted, he he did have to be a good leader, and I don't know how he kept people not from cutting his head off. But um, yeah, uh, just, yeah, that's know. true. Yeah, I don't know so where I'm going. Actually, no, I think you're hitting on an important point, which is this this notion of great, this the great man theory, right? That and, and it's called that for a reason because it's this this weird element of of uh, of some history where we obsess about an individual, almost always a man as as the reason that things changed for the better and when in reality so many more people contributed that are positive, and very often women who never get any glory for it uh were, were 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 central to it but it's not a single great man that we're sitting around waiting for to change everything mm -hmm. uh no in reality it's you know it's 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 sometimes small actions it's rosa parks sitting on the bus that that precipitates the work of thousands and thousands of, of people more, some of whom we lionize, justly so, uh, many of whom we forget about, but all of whom were, were critical to changing the world for the better. Mm -hmm. All right. So la la last question um, is, because I see some books behind you, so I'm hoping maybe you'll have some book recommendations for people who are like, <laughs> oh, you know, I'm excited about conservation, or maybe they like listening to you and think, hey, what would this guy like to read? Maybe they're all like kids books. I don't know. I see books, I think. So I'm just curious, like, do you Books or any resources you'd recommend, like for learning or like uh, gaining more knowledge? Uh, one great resource for gaining knowledge, at least about conservation, is Manga Bay, M-O-N-G-A-B-A-Y, uh, which is a just a fantastic news site. Essentially, it's a website about about conservation biodiversity. It's it's great. You can you can dive in real quick, read read a whole bunch, and and, and get out of there. We're increasing the stories that we've got on our digital makerspace and conservationx.com as well. If you're kind of interested, especially on the tech side of things, uh, which I think is, is really cool. Books that, that, that are, are, are great. Uh, that's a, there are a lot of books. Those are not the children's books. They're in the other room. <laughs> um, I can only see the spine. So it's like, they, they look thick enough to be adult books. So I thought maybe I'd ask. I read like a book a day. So I, I always have to ask for more or else I just start. Okay. Reading. Here's, here's, here's one that's on here that I love, which hopefully you haven't read. It's called Nabokov's blues. Mm -mm. So, uh, Vladimir Nabokov, who wrote Lolita, the author, uh, uh, so famous author, as it turns out, also is obsessed with this this group of butterflies called blue morphos, and is still the, the the work that he did on those is considered some of the very best science ever done on on this group of butterflies. Uh, and so this book, I, it's a great book. It's just a fun read about 
so if you're into literature and 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 as well kind of naturalism or or science or or nature Nabokov's Blues I think is a really fun one I'm I'm I'm, just, I'm literally looking at those books to sort of see <laughs> see where they're at also you probably read my former boss uh, Peter D Mandis his book Abundance you, you may have have that come across I think that's a fantastic recommendation it's it's uh it's optimistic it's forward thinking uh, there's some people will disagree heavily with it, but I think it's it's a really really important um, sort of zeitgeist uh, piece of work as well to, that, that, that's relevant to, to a lot of a lot think, of what we've, we've been talking about. I think the best books, you know, even if even if they have content you don't just you don't agree with, I think the best books are, are books that make ask good questions and like give you different facts and stuff to work on. So I'll read books even of yep. subjects that I dislike or that I don't agree with, and it's I'll like make- yeah. Well, that's, well that's, you probably will agree with, with with that one, but that's that's a you know it, it's just another really interesting one. I mean, that's you know I also I'm a big biography fan, so I love Walter Isaacson's books. I think what he yeah, what he wrote on they're really good, super super interesting. Yeah, I also you know I'm trying to think of like things in the naturalism space. <laughs> I, I, I have a lot on the show well, uh, as well. I'll, I'll recommend a book to you. Then. You know what? Can I can I offer you one more recommendation? And yeah, I'll send yeah, yeah. It. it turns out my my co-founder uh, on Conservation X Labs has his first book coming out. Um, and it's all about, he was in Afghanistan. He set up the first national park in Afghanistan. It's all about conservation in the middle of conflict. So you can imagine how do you preserve biodiversity and set up national parks in the middle of the Afghan war in, in the early 2000s. Um, I, 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 because I know him, I've gotten to read it, which in, 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 in uh, you know, early things, but it's coming out this, this winter and I'll, I'll make sure I send you one. It's really good. It's, it's, it's just, it's fantastic, like storytelling, but like deep details on, 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 the Asiatic cheetah, the, mm-hmm. you know, and snow leopard, and 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 these these iconic species. That how do we how do we protect things in places that that are besought by deep deep challenges of conflict, for example. Mm-hmm. So what's the book called? Yeah, <laughs> it's called the Snow Leopard Project. It'll be out this uh, this winter. I forget the exact date, but Alex Dagan, D E H G A N, is my co-founder and, and dear friend. Uh, his first book coming out. So if you love snow leopards or are interested in things like how do you how do you how do you do difficult tasks in the middle of a war zone? Uh, it'll it, it's really good. I'm mm-hmm. I'm I'm very proud to to know the guy who who wrote it. And, uh, Excellent. I will, I will make sure you get a copy as soon as it's released. And that was Paul Boonge of Conservation X Labs. I hope every single one of you got inspired to be doing some conservation and you learned how you can get involved. And that's the biggest thing. Like I think a lot of us have these desires to help out, and now you can go to one place, see what's out there, or put your skills up and help out let me if you love this episode hate this episode think nothing of this episode send me an email let me know i want all the feedback other than that i want to inform people before we go that there is a new way to show support for the podcast and to keep it advertisement free from now until forever which is called patreon if you go to patreon and look for learning with lowell you'll see this podcast don't forget to subscribe and leave a review we can be found on twitter at lowell this year facebook and on the website learningwithlowell.com also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every monday new episodes every tuesday and new blog posts around every thursday remember to share and tell your friends please and thank you